uh, Judge Tim Temkevich. I sit on the uh, Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. I'm located in uh, Denver and have been on the bench since uh, 2003. But uh, 25 years ago um, at this conference, um, I was sitting where you are. Um, I was a student and had the opportunity to attend the first annual National Student Symposium at Yale Law School. And uh, I remember uh, having the opportunity to meet uh, uh, Professor Steve Calabresi, who was then a uh, struggling law student. Uh, and uh, another law student was uh, David McIntosh, who you met last night also, who was, uh, what, second year at the University of Chicago Law School. So it's um, uh, a great pleasure to uh, uh, reunite with some friends uh, uh, here again this year. Um, this year, once again, the uh, uh, conference will challenge us to look at law and society from a variety of viewpoints. Um, our topic this morning is moral choices and the um, Eighth Amendment, and we have um, a wonderful group of uh, speakers that's going to explore that uh, topic. In fact, you know, thinking back 25 years ago, I had the chance to um, introduce some um, of the pr uh, panelists, I was a moderator for that student symposium, and um, one of the uh, one of the uh, panelists was uh, Professor John Noonan, um, who later became uh, Judge John Noonan. Um, I think there was a Professor Easterbrook or Bork or Posner there also. So, um, gentlemen, just be careful with my introductions; it may lead to something else. Um, our, our topic again this morning is moral choices and the um, Eighth Amendment. Few areas of the law are so permeated with the stark moral choices as uh, capital punishment. Our Constitution gives legislatures great leeways in imposing punishments for crimes, and the Eighth Amendment only restricts those which impose cruel and unusual punishments. In the area of the death penalty or capital uh, punishment, those words have been vigorously debated, um, especially in the context of moral theory uh, for many generations. In 1958, just to give a little historical context, um, the Supreme Court said in Trope versus Dulles that the cruel, quote, the cruel and unusual language must, must draw its meaning from evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of maturing society. Um, grandiose and important words, but um, what do they mean? Um, well, what they meant was a struggle in the United States Supreme Court about the um, constitutionality of the uh, death penalty, um, culminating in 1972 in, in the uh, case of Furman versus Georgia, which um, struck down Georgia's t death penalty law. Um, after that, the debate continued because, of course, um, legislatures in the various states re-instituted um, new capital punishment regi regimes um, in, in, in accord with um, what the Supreme Court said in Furman was permissible. Um, but we saw um, opinions um, marking various degrees of, of uh, moral language um, from a variety of the judges and justices, um, Justice Marshall, Justice Brennan, Justice Blackmun um, famously Im imported the language of moral uh, discourse into their views of the death penalty. And uh, in fact, Justice Blackmun in his, um, uh, in his last year on the court famously remarked in um, Callens versus Collins, um, from this day forward, I no longer shall tinker with the machine, machinery of death and um, took the position that the death penalty was unconstitutional. In recent years, the Supreme Court has been forthright about the moral dimension of the death penalty, uh, most recently in two cases, first in Atkins versus Virginia in 2002 and then Roper versus Simmons in 2005. In Atkins, the Supreme Court struck down the execution of mentally retarded looking at a perceived national and international consensus against such a practice. Atkins is notable, of course, for looking at foreign law as a part of its assessment of the evolving standards of decency language. And in Roper, of course, the Supreme Court barred the execution of, ju of juveniles. Justice Kennedy's opinion drew on both the national consensus and again, quote, the stark reality that the United States is alone in the world in allowing the juvenile death penalty. The judicial debate, of course, is part of the national conversation on punishment and capital punishment in, in uh, particular. We may be in a new phase of the debate, and I offer a couple of illustrations that I hope our speakers will um, place in context in, in their remarks. Um, first of all, in the last um, few years, we've had um, a new look at the uh, about the imposition of the death penalty and the quality of the evidence in the cases that uh, 
um, have led to um, verdicts with the death penalty. Um, right here in Illinois, uh, the governor pardoned every prisoner on the death row because of a belief that there were innocent uh, prisoners that might be executed. And you see that as a trend uh, reflecting new, new um, advances in technology, DNA testing, for example, um, and active groups like the Innocence Project who um, are seeking to, um, to uh, revisit um, many of these um, cases where um, prisoners have been on death row. Uh, maybe culminating with some of that uh, debate in the executive branch of state governments, um, we look at last year, 2006, there were only 53 um, executions nationally, and uh, one half of those were in one state, uh, Texas. Um, secondly, um, many um, state and federal courts have looked at the um, imposition of the death penalty and the methodology by which it has been imposed. Um, although many forms of capital punishment have been upheld as constitutional, um, in the area of execution by lethal injection, which is the predominant method, in the United States, there's been a string of challenges to um, that methodology through um, both habeas petitions and through um, 1983 constitutional challenge. Um, the legal theory in those cases is that the, um, the um, uh, what they call the, uh, the execution cocktail, um, in, in fact, imposes um, severe pain um, on the prisoner during the uh, imposition of the death penalty. And because of that uncertainty as a fact, um, many courts have, have uh, stayed executions. And uh, recently in, uh, in Florida, the, the uh, governor has um, halted executions while they um, examined their um, death penalty legal, uh, lethal, um, lethal execution protocol. Um, in my circuit, the 10th Circuit, we, um, we have about 35 um, uh, capital punishment cases um, in the uh, federal system. In the last six months, we've had two cases that involve the uh, lethal injun injection question. In both cases, our court um, has allowed the state of, uh, of Oklahoma to go forward with its, um, uh, with its uh, executions. And in, um, interestingly, interestingly, in both cases, the Supreme Court um, has denied stays of execution um, on the theory that uh, these cases should wait until there's been a merits uh, determination on whether um, whether lethal injection, in fact, um, um, creates severe pain that would constitute possibly um, cruel and unusual um, punishment. Um, finally, we see um, a number of new governors um, opposed to the death penalty um, in this most recent round of elections last, uh, last year. Um, several um, candidates, winning candidates, have opposed the death penalty, and perhaps we see some new uh, changes in the, um, in the uh, national or social consensus in, in um, uh, both around the country and in particular states. Um, I saw in the Washington Post on Thursday that the governor of uh, Maryland said that uh, the use of capital punishment was, quote, inherently unjust, um, quote, unquote, and also a, a, quote, an affront to individual human dignity, and is calling for its abolition in, uh, in uh, in uh, Maryland. Um, in my home state of Colorado, um, there's a legislative effort to shift all of the funds that are used for um, prosecuting death penalties, which, um, as you know, can be in the millions of dollars um, uh, in the lifetime of these cases, and uh, move, those, move those dollars over to the investigation of what um, the sponsor would call cold cases, to redirect money from the um, capital punishment arena to um, a different part of law enforcement. Um, with that national debate, our topic is certainly very important um, this morning, and we have three distinguished panelists to consider the moral dimensions of the Eighth Amendment. Um, our three speakers are Lawrence Kloss of the University of San Diego Law School, um, Ron Allen, um, right here of Northwestern uh, Law School, and uh, Michael Moore of the University of Illinois um, College of Law. Um, our first speaker, and I'll introduce him now, and then I'll introduce the other speakers when their turn uh, comes up, is Lawrence um, Klaus. Uh, Professor Klaus is a graduate of the University of Queensland um, School of Law. Um, he clerked here in Chicago for Frank Easterbrook on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in uh, 1999 and 2000. He was a John M. Olin Fellow in Law at Northwestern University School of Law prior to joining the University of San Diego Law Faculty in 2001. Early appointment, appointments include clerkships to distinguished jurists in 
his native Australia, and three years in the Office of Foreign Litigation in the United States Department of Justice, based at the U.S. Embassy in London. His publications include Implications in the Concept of a Constitution and Federalism in the Judges, um, both published in the Australian Law Journal. With that, let me uh, welcome Professor Klaus to, the, to Northwestern University School of Law. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I'd like to begin our discussion uh, this morning with a little bit about the long and celebrated history of the language that became the Eighth Amendment. Uh, when the first Congress included that language uh, in the Bill of Rights, they were appropriating an artifact of their English heritage. Uh, at that moment, 1789, uh, the language was having its centenary. Uh, that language was first drafted and passed by the English Parliament in 1689, in the Bill of Rights of 1689. Uh, Parliament had uh, created that document to articulate uh, limitations on what future monarchs could do. A century later, uh, congressional debate uh, about the inclusion of this language as a limitation on what American governments could do, uh, national governments, uh, entities could do, uh, like that in the uh, revolutionary states, which in the wake of uh, independence uh, passed bills of rights containing this language, starting with Virginia in 1776. Uh, the, the debate in, in each of those fora was pretty muted. Um, and I would suggest to you that what that suggests um, is that in adopting the language, uh, the American founders were claiming a uh, part of their English heritage, part of what they had fought for, part of what they claimed had been denied to them by uh, the monarch and unrepresentative parliament in the revolutionary period, and meant it to mean whatever it had meant to their heritage. Uh, the whole strategy for asserting uh, political wrongs and for claiming uh, political entitlements of adopting a seriatim listing uh, is very much part of the English political tradition, going back to Magna Carta, and uh, the very usage of the term Bill of Rights in popular parlance to describe these new documents that the revolutionary states adopted was an allusion to the English Bill of Rights. Um, and indeed, as was Jefferson's declaration, an allusion to the seriatim listing of wrongs with which the English Declaration a century before had begun. The English Declaration is a big old list of things that James had done wrong, King James, whom they just ousted. Uh, he has done this thing, he has done that thing, among them being uh, his judges have uh, imposed excessive bail, uh, excessive fines, and uh, cruel and illegal punishments. And then on the flip side of the document, when one, ha one has the corresponding rights that were to be protected in the future, one saw a prohibition of excessive bail, excessive fines, and cruel and unusual punishments. Uh, the uh, Jefferson, of course, seizes on that formula when drafting the Declaration of Independence, except he substitutes George for James, uh, reminding the English that they too had rebelled against a monarch who had uh, uh, been oppressive and not accorded them the historic rights of Englishmen. So this was, this was a strategy that one saw played out in that revolutionary period and reflected again in the adoption of, an, of a national uh, document that similarly mirrored um, of this English format. Uh, well, that might tempt us to ask what the language of excessive bail, excessive fines, and cruel and unusual punishments meant to the English. Uh, and the answer is that it was a reaction to the way in which courts in the 1680s uh, under King James had uh, treated political and religious enemies of the king. Uh, it actually invited an ostensibly objective inquiry, believe it or not. It did not purport to authorise a clash of subjective impressions by which uh, judges would trump uh, other government actors' perceptions of what was a good punishment or not. Um, it was rather perceived to be invoking something that could be determined with some objectivity, and here's why. Uh, excessiveness, you notice, 
was only used in res as, a, as, the, as the prohibition in respect of bail and fines, not in respect of punishments generally, because excessiveness in respect of bail and fines could be measured objectively. Bail and fines were excessive if they were more than the offender could pay. Bail and fines were excessive if they were used as a device to impose indefinite imprisonment, which is exactly what James's judges had been doing to his political and religious enemies on minor pretexts, trivial offences, which under the Habeas Corpus Act had to be the subject of bail before conviction and the imposition of mere fines afterward, the judges were locking up his enemies permanently. And uh, this indeed was exactly what that language of excessive, prohibition of excessiveness in bail and fines was designed to prevent in the future. Cruel unusualness in other punishments was constituted by being departures from the common law in the direction of greater severity uh, without the kinds of morally sufficient reasons that would indicate an, an evolved understanding of the common law. In other words, the punishments at issue, and Parliament considered some very concrete examples uh, and, and pardoned uh, some people, uh, arranged for the monarch to pardon some people who'd been subject to some of these uh, cruel and unusual sentences. They were punishments that were simply beyond what the common law provided for the offence of conviction, imposed on the irrelevant ground that the particular person was a political or religious enemy of the king. Uh, so the, the concept was one of discriminatory treatment, effectively, that, this, that the common law uh, of the time provided broadly what was a reasonable punishment for the, a particular offence, and this particular person had been targeted for a discriminatorily harsher punishment. And that's what made it cruel and unusual. Um, well, now we have these words in our constitution that we've got to apply in the 21st century. And as Article 3 locates, within the judicial power of the United States, disputes about matters arising under the constitution, it's pretty clear that judges have to apply the Eighth Amendment. And that Eighth Amendment clearly in invites a moral inquiry. Um, and now that we're realists about the nature of law, effectively, we're inviting judges to supplant uh, legislature's subjective impressions with their own. But that still requires, but, but even accepting that requires us to still ask the nature of the moral inquiry that uh, is to be engaged in when we come to the Eighth Amendment. Notice that the word cruel uh, is uh, linguistically susceptible of three quite distinct connotations. And each of these call for distinct moral inquiries for what counts as cruel. Uh, candidate number one, uh, proportionality of amount. Is this punishment immorally too much? Is it excessive? That's candidate number one, let's say, for what counts as cruel. Candidate number two, viciousness of method. Is this punishment immoral in its method? Is it just a kind, a, a manner of punishment that's morally unacceptable? That's Justice Scalia's candidate, by the way, as you probably know. Candidate number three, invidious discrimination in application. Is this punishment immorally more than is imposed on others for comparable conduct? Right? And in that sense, cruel and unusual. Uh, as what I've told you about the English history, might suggest to you that might be the candidate that best fits the English history. Um, uh, and of course gives a clear uh, connotation to the word unusual. Uh, the Supreme Court's Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, as it now stands, amounts to saying, we'll have them all. We'll have all of these things, right? If, if any of these things are implicated by a punishment, if we think it's immorally too much, if we think the method's vicious, or if we think that it's being applied in a discriminatory fashion, we'll say cruel and unusual. Um, in particular, of course, in, in, in the recent cases, the focus has been on a proportionality inquiry. Is it immorally too much? Is the punishment excessive uh, in the view of the court? The difficulty with a disproportionality inquiry in respect of uh, the phrase uh, is that um, disproportionality might indeed be cruel, that might be uh, linguistically sensible, but of course that doesn't make it necessarily unusual. The other two candidates, of course, more readily fit both elements of the uh, 
uh, criteria. And if you've got a new or a newly uh, revived uh, vicious method of punishment, well, it's easy to call that unusual. Um, uh, if you've got invidiously discriminatory application uh, of a punishment, well, of course that's unusual. And indeed, that's the historic conception uh, of the language, or the closest modern translation thereto. Uh, but the court, of course, wants to do proportionality inquiries under the Eighth Amendment, uh, wants to be able to say that a punishment violates the amendment because the court thinks that it's excessive. So the court then has to cast about for a way to allege unusualness. And the way the court has um, achieved that end has been to hit on inter-jurisdictional comparison. We'll contrast that with the original connotation of the, the language, which concerned intra-jurisdictional comparison. Right? The language was written to combat punishments that were novel compared with what like offenders received within the jurisdiction, not compared with what offenders were receiving in other jurisdictions. Um, note also that the court's usage of inter-jurisdictional comparison is not treated as uh, actually necessary to its application of uh, the, the prohibition. Um, that Justice Stevens in particular made quite clear at Atkins in Virginia that if the court thought a punishment excessive, uh, the court could strike it down even if an interjurisdictional survey did not show it on the court's own terms to be unusual. So uh, resort to interjurisdictional comparison has effectively become a bit like use of legislative history, something that you, know, you look for your friends and you seize on them if, if, they, if you can use them to bolster your case for unusualness. But in the absence of uh, good, exa good exemplars, the court's made clear that if it thinks something's excessive, if it thinks it's merely cruel but not unusual, it will nonetheless strike it down under the Eighth Amendment. Uh, the resort to interjurisdictional comparison in these cases has, of course, contributed to the recent uh, lament about the court's reliance on foreign law. And I think that lament's been expressed uh, in some quarters too broadly. The interesting question, I'd suggest, in relation to the use of foreign law in constitutional exposition, uh, is whether the Constitution calls for it. If the right translation into a modern context of the phrase cruel and unusual punishments were punishments disproportionate when compared with what other jurisdictions are imposing, um, then the right understanding of unusual would call for um, an inquiry into the content of foreign law. You'd have to look at other jurisdictions and find out what the right answer was. Um, now, under a pre-realist view of the common law as a higher body of shared principle, uh, to which courts in multiple jurisdictions were striving, including courts in the mother country, in England, uh, the concept of intra-jurisdictional novelty would not have been so readily distinguishable from that of inter-jurisdictional novelty as it is today. Because, of course, back then there was a sense in which, the, for purposes of the common law, the common law world was viewed as one big jurisdiction. Um, but, uh, and of course, we, you know, Holmes and Frankfurt are famously uh, talked about that, the way the great old treatises cited case law from England and various American jurisdictions interchangeably. But now, of course, uh, the uh, distinction between inter-jurisdictional novelty and intra-jurisdictional novelty is stark, and for reasons that suggest that intra-jurisdictional novelty is the most faithful translation of the historic inquiry into a modern context. Uh, the language of cruel and unusual punishments never invited uh, historically, a general inquiry into how governments around the globe were treating people. It never involved comparison even with the uh, penal regimes of continental Europe. It was about what the common law required in the places where the common law applied. Uh, the legitimate basis for complaint about the use of foreign law in the context of the Eighth Amendment cases, I think, is not with, the, with its use per se, but with the claimed character of the judicial inquiries that lead to the use. The real reason to complain about uh, those decisions is that judges are asking themselves the wrong question. They are just asking what's excessive in our view. Um, if judges were asking themselves the right question, and the one that the Constitution most plausibly invites, which I would suggest is what's discriminatory, uh, then the extent to which foreign law might help to supply an answer would uh, be uncontroversial. Um, and, of course, a very moral inquiry would still be mandated by the clause. The upshot, therefore, I, I think, is that the Eighth Amendment clearly invites a moral inquiry. Um, the court has, however, treated it as inviting multiple distinct moral inquiries, as if its words were a chameleon. Uh, that conclusion, absent historical evidence to support it, 
is a bit like holding that the Second Amendment protects both gun possession and upper limbs. Um, uh, such a, you know, exploitation of linguistic happenstance um, seems a kind of dubious way to apply any law, let alone a constitution. Thank you, Professor. Our, our second speaker this morning is Professor um, Ron Allen, who needs uh, very little uh, introduction here at Northwestern. Uh, professor Allen is the uh, uh, John Henry Wigmore Professor of Law and has been at the, uh, at the university for many years. He did his un undergraduate work in mathematics at Marshall University and studied law at the University of Michigan. He's an internationally recognized expert in the fields of evidence procedure and constitutional law. He has published five books and approximately 80 articles in major law reviews. The New York Times referred to him as one of the nation's leading experts on evidence and procedure. He has been quoted in national news outlets hundreds of times and appears regularly on national broadcast media in matters ranging from complex litigation to constitutional law uh, to criminal justice. He's an author of one of the most widely used textbooks in, co in constitutional criminal uh, procedure and evidence and uh, has contributed uh, mightily in that area. He also consults on the, in the areas of punitive damages and constitutional limits on non-economic dam damages. Um, he's a winner of the Dean's Teaching Award here at the Northwestern University for three of the last four years and um, I'm really pleased to hear that. I have a Northwestern University law grad in my chambers this year and one next year so um, they're doing a good job training uh, future law clerks. Uh, with that, Professor Ron Allen. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm uh, a great admirer of both the uh, Federalist Society and the members of uh, this panel. Uh, Michael Moore is an old friend uh, from whom I've learned a lot over the years. He's made m m many contributions to uh, our understanding across a wide range of fields. Lawrence Klaus is at the beginning of his career, but it looks like it, uh, that he's going to be doing the same sorts of things. And I think we played, we at Northwestern played a small role in getting you off to a, to a running start in your career, and it's great to, to have you back again. And, and uh, Judge, uh, I'm a great admirer of judges, uh, even though I may say a few things that are critical today. Uh, but I just want you to know they're not aimed at you, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm a tremendous admirer of the Federalist Society. Uh, I think you all do a great work. Uh, I'm not as active as many, some of my colleagues, but uh, that's not because of lack of admiration. So as I say, I'm really honored beyond, me beyond measured to be asked to participate today. I'm equal, equally mystified beyond measure as to why I was asked to be here today. I may in my misguided and uh, misspent uh, youth have written something that, that might have suggested that I deliberately was taking a normative stance on some question my work was addressing, but I would like to take this opportunity to publicly confess and do penance uh, for having committed the sin of thinking that anyone outside of my family, and maybe even them, uh, would have the slightest interest in my subjective uh, stances towards things, and the even more horrendous sin of by doing so surely boring others to tears. Uh, it seems to me, at any rate, that the, what passes for normative scholarship in the law schools is little more than making public the topography of the author's mind. Now, I suppose this does have a certain appeal akin to the great national interest uh, in reality shows these days, uh, but for the life of me, it's unclear what other interest it serves than the obvious ones of perhaps getting tenure and getting invited to conferences. Thus, my own scholarly efforts are directed towards propositions with truth value, and I leave the moralizing to others. To be sure, there can be scholarship about normative questions that's motivated by pursuit of truth, frankly, such as the many fine efforts of Michael Moore in laying out the landscape of normative discourse. These works, however, are not normative, whatever motivates them, in the sense pertinent to today, and thus they're outside of my consideration. Normative scholarship in involving the defense or critique of, of normative positions could serve other purposes, such as facilitating inquiry into, into underlying factual issues. For example, the great national debate on welfare might have focused attention on how short -term, the short-term desire to ameliorate woeful living conditions might contribute to long-term devastating effects. Or maybe more pertinent to today's topic, how the, uh, how the desire to legitimate and express retributive feelings uh, 
through the death penalty assumes accuracy and consistency in decision making that, if not present, might have quite radically unintended effects. And to be fair, maybe the debates that we have in the law school and the legal literature do filter into the public's consciousness in such a way as to have a positive educational effect, but I doubt it. The moral cast of much of our normative arguments is completely epiphenomenal. It does not matter to others what we think of welfare programs or the death penalty. What matters is their consequences. Or so I suspect the world at large, quite intelligently in my view, believes. To the extent it serves useful purposes, uh, one could entirely strip out all the moralizing uh, references and just leave whatever underlying factual or analytical inquiry there is. And certainly we do not educate ourselves or advance knowledge with these debates. Uh, if we did, it would be commonplace for people to confess error in their views and revise them accordingly. But how often have you seen that occur? Or its blood cousin, the public recognition that analysis and investigation has forced the truth of a proposition upon a person that is repugnant to that individual. Exactly, just as often as I have, virtually uh, never. The stability of personal preferences is especially true with respect to the particular subset of normative discourse pertinent today, moral propositions. Indeed, what is prevalent is the opposite of reconsideration. A proposition, theory, moral position is advanced and meets heavy going, uh, which in turn prop prompts its enthusiasts to modify its justifications rather than modify its contours as, say, a scientist facing an anomaly would, would do. Around Northwestern, for example, it is commonplace to have yet another defense of the unitary executive or originalism or a particular view of separation of power, often prefaced in my highly ironic uh, view, uh, with statements to the effect that, well, you, you know, previous defenses of this view uh, have not fared considerably well, so here's another one. What occurs to me is that perhaps the failure of the prior defenses might be explanatory of the truth or utility of the idea, but this particular idea seems not to be making much headway. Rather than pursue knowledge, the objective of uh, normative work in general and uh, moral reason in particular seems much more directed at defending one's prior subjective views than it is in advancing knowledge. The game is never to give in, no matter what evidence is arrayed against you. Come up with a clever response, create sophisticated arguments deflecting the latest criticism. Indeed, I'll, I predict we'll see something like this today. I personally, very subjectively, and I'm probably going to bore you with the next few sentences, find this all completely tedious and sufficient reason in and of itself, in my subjective opinion, to ban it from constitutional discourse. When the focus shifts from moralizing, uh, moral proselytizing, proselytizing generally to the Supreme Court doing it specifically, an additional problem arises. Normative views are largely and probably exclusively subjective creations of the minds of individuals, which is precisely why normative views are so immune to change. I have no doubt that they form for reasons, but those reasons are just as surely the culmination of a person's experiences. This sort of thing is not going to lend itself to rational discourse. If moral negotiation is to, is, is to occur, it will, meet, it will need to be done in a sustained fashion over time in a complex and chaotic environment, in a legislature, for example, or in citizen movements. Courts issuing edicts are about the last place that one would predict that moralizing would be useful or effective. These points will seem to some of you, like Michael, as hopelessly naive philosophically and to others as virtually beside the point. The concern of naivete comes from the implicit suggestion that subjectivity can be eliminated, and maybe it cannot. But one can have more or less of it. When I am doing arithmetic sums, perhaps there is an, uh, 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 an element of subjectivity. After all, it is me choosing to do the sums. But I can choose to follow the rules or not. So too judges or anyone else. The concern of irrelevance is that, like it or not, moral propositions exist, regardless of their truth value. Uh, many individuals see them as pertinent to deciding cases, and plainly, in some cases, in need of decision, sources of law run out. I don't doubt that for a moment. And invoking a moral proposition or two might be a handy way out of a difficult problem. I agree with all this, but again, one can have more or less of it. And so, inescapably, the question becomes the role of judges generally, and Supreme Court justices particularly. Here, I think the evidence is pretty plain. Judges are no better than the rest of us at moral reasoning. Indeed, the most disastrous decisions, and this is an empirical point, I mean, we can talk about the evidence, even the most disastrous decisions of the Supreme Court are highly associated with their most willful decisions, ones in which extra legal determinations play a significant role in decision. This should come as a surprise to no one for precisely the reason identified above. 
The judicial process is not conducive to effective moral discourse. The legislative and political processes more generally are, which seems to me to be a good reason to leave such matters largely to them. But what does largely mean? Uh, haven't I already recognized that moral questions may be ineradicable in judicial decisions, even if we prefer less rather than more attention paid to them? If so, aren't I just still avoiding the question? Don't I need a general theory whether I think moral propositions should be on the front or back burner? Here is the one point today at which I, perhaps I can provide you something useful to think about. The only general theory pertinent to the kinds of questions we are addressing today is that no general theory is worth a damn, as Holmes said. There are endless uh, efforts to provide general theories of judges and of legislating and, and the meaning of law and so, and so on, and none of them is worth a damn. But one can explain why, why not in a single word, complexity. These objects of theorizing, not all objects of all theorizing, but these objects of theorizing are complex human institutions of thousands if not millions of relevant variables that can in interact in virtually an infinite number of ways. A general theory would have to articulate the sets of necessary and sufficient conditions for outcomes in light of all the combinations and permutations of these variables. And of course, now many of these variables are not dichotomous, They're adding yet another layer of complexities. These issues are discussed at length in the evidence literature, and I'll not take up your time with them. Uh, I know as soon as you put down your copies of the Constitution and your copies of the Federalist Papers, you turn to the probability debates and evidence. So I, I won't go over well-known uh, well ground, but I will just give one example to make the point con concrete. Uh, computational complexity uh, remains the reason why computers still struggle to beat the best human chess players. Even though there are only, this is going to end eventually as computational capacity increases, but it's really remarkable how, uh, how long it's taken for the programmers to, and, the, and the computer scientists to create machines that can beat our good, our good chess players. But, and the reason is that even though there are only a limited number of pieces and a limited number of moves, the combinations of moves quickly spirals out of control so that cognitive devices other than computation can still affect outcomes. Uh, but these cognitive devices are not reducible to rules, at least not yet. If they were, they could be programmed and the game between computers and humans would be over. The game of legislating and judging is infinitely more complex than chess. And one obvious solution is to let judges, or excuse me, that was a terrible slip, to, to let legislatures be the source of ongoing moral debate um, and direct the courts to decide which of the parties' cases is more plausible. To be sure, plausible may have its reference from time to time in extra legal considerations, but so long as the judicial stance is largely cho choosing over the party's presentations, its conclusions are always revisable. Thus, by the way, the genius of the common law. What I'm describing, in fact, seems to me the best description of our actual institutions, and again, in fact, our institutions have produced, in my judgment, the most astonishing civilization the world has ever seen. So if you're into creating astonishing civilizations as your subject of motivation, one might want to pay attention to these matters. How does all this map onto the assertion by the majority of the court in Roper versus Simmons that the justices had to make up their own personal moral judgments about the propriety of aspects of capital punishment? Pretty obviously, I suspect. There's no obvious reason to rely on the personal views of the justices, and there are very good reasons not to. There may be sources of law that had not run out in the context of the Eighth Amendment. Lawrence just made an interesting argument that there were, in my opinion. But assume to the contrary, and thus that something like evolving notions of decency is an appropriate gap filler. Still, the extension of evolving notions can be widespread conventions rather than radically subjective moral beliefs of the individual justices, even if determining what widespread means involves a subjective component. Obviously, making that determination might be influenced by a judge's moral views, but again, the significance of the subjective beliefs can be reduced. And the decision does not have to be in terms of hard descriptions of those evolving notions, but instead in terms of what can be inferred from the presentation of the parties. Which in, short is the more, is the more, which, in short, is the more plausible case. Approaching decision thusly has many consequences, although whether they are advantages will depend upon your own interests. Most are matters that have been discussed at length in the literature and need no extended treatment here, having to do with democratic processes and legitimation and the, and the like. Such decision-making has the further advantage, less discussed, of leaving open uh, decision to whatever arguments might be advanced in the, in the future, rather than constraining that future by guesses concerning the moral temperament of judges. Of course, in light of your interest, you might think this an unappealing prescri prescription. I predict that our next speaker will think that. <laughs>
largely because he rejects the truth of one of the propositions upon which I am operating, to wit that moral views are radically subjective reflections of experience and do not correspond to, correspond to mind independent entities in the necessary sense. In short, that moral propositions do not possess truth value in that sense. If one thought that moral propositions do possess truth value, the problems of governing might appear to be eased considerably. For obviously one should join the grand pursuit of truth and justice in the American way. There are two difficulties. That moral propositions possess truth value in the right way is obviously false. And even if it's true, there's an insurmountable epistemological gap of knowing when one has arrived at the truth. One way to understand the history of the 20th century, 20th century in fact, is that it is one large example of how deadly these difficulties are. A few words about both of these difficulties and then I will close. I cannot do more than give a flavor of why the proposition that moral propositions have truth value in the right sense is false. The best defense is, in fact, Michael's. Uh, the Reader's Digest version of this argument, which is a very complex argument, is this. He asks you to compare two propositions. One, it's true that it's wrong for two boys to douse a, cat, douse a cat with kerosene and light it on fire for their own amusement. And two, it's true that protons exist. He engages in an extended argument to show that the truth of the moral proposition is the best explanation of the evidence of your reaction to the burning cat, just as the truth of the proposition that protons exist is the best explanation of centuries of scientific progress in the physical sciences. He is an avowed empiricist, but there are two striking empirical problems with this claim. First, there's no convincing demonstration that the obvious alternative hypothesis about moral propositions, that they are conventions that reflect background ex and experience, is not an equally good or better explanation. By contrast, many theories of matter have been advanced as substitutes for the standard atomic model, and they've largely been dis dis verified one by one over the centuries. This leads to the second empirical problem. Faced with competing theories, a true empiricist would construct a test to differentiate them, and nowhere in the hundreds of pages written in defense, whether by Michael or others, of the truth of moral propositions that I've read, although I don't purport to have read at all, is such a program, an empirical program, ever advanced. The defenses are all truly rhetoric, rhetorical. This is all the more striking because such tests could be easily constructed. If it's the case that it is the, that it is the moral truth that it is wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, that causes a sense that the boy's actions were wrong in burning the cat, just like pro proteins, then this should be universal and people everywhere should have the same reaction, just like protons behave identically everywhere in si when scientific experiments are done. We can test this by polling a random selection of humans across the planet. Were we to do so, I predict the results would not confirm the hypothesis. In large portions of the planet, the inhabitants would be supremely indifferent to boys burning cats. Another test, that prop remember, we're not talking about boys in Ann Arbor or Chicago or Madison, we're talking about them in Bangladesh and, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia and Europe and, uh, and, and Louisiana and everywhere across the world. <laughs> uh, not that I know anything about Louisiana and cat burning, I don't want to <laughs> suggest to the contrary, but you, I, I think, take it you get my point. Another test, the proposition that causing unnecessary suffering of animals is bad must generalize, just like the properties of proton, protons are general. They don't change when locked in an atom of water or copper. They behave the, the same uh, everywhere. Now quickly think of all the cases of unnecessary inf in suffering inflicted on animals that's perfectly acceptable to large swaths of humanity. Bullfighting, cockfighting, dogfighting, people fighting. Hunting and fishing in all their manifestations, rodeos, zoos, medical experiments on animals. What happened to the truth of the moral proposition? Press the matter further. Consider all the suffering that goes on. You want to talk about suffer unnecessary suffering for animals, go down to the slaughterhouses. Consider all the suffering that goes on in our nation's slaughterhouses, yet none of us needs to eat meat. We'd probably be better off without it. And none of us need leather shoes or belts or coats. Aren't we killing all these animals and breeding them under horrendous conditions for our enjoyment? Again, where is the moral proposition? Perhaps it's asleep somewhere, bored like me, by all this moralizing that people are doing. Well, as I say, I very much doubt that I would convince anyone pre-committed to the truth of moral propositions merely by asking them to be serious about their commitments to empiricism. They will respond that they are quite serious about both and will advance arguments that all cases I have identified of unnecessary cruelty to animals are just cases of people acting wrongly. All those pe billions of people are just wrong, wrong, wrong. Fine. And now the epistemological problem, my, my last point. How do we know that? How do we know whose intuitions to tap into to determine the contours of this quite elusive set of true moral propositions? 
Now look at the history of the 20th century, century through the lens of individuals who were confident that they were in possession of truth. What was the result? Mass slaughter of over 100 million people in wars and fought over truth and massive and deliberately induced starvation to the same end. And this is not the only century in which battles over truth devastated, hum truth of this kind devastated humanity. The religious wars in Europe are another example and so on. What's the lesson to be learned from this if you're an empiricist? It seems to me that unless you're in favor of mass killings, we need to cabin and confine those who make claims to access to moral truth. We need to keep such people from the levers of power and especially from the institutions of organized force. We need to create ways to permit moral negotiations proceed that can generate largely acceptable outcomes in substantial part because those outcomes are always revisable in ways responsive to the interests, interests of the citizenry, citizenry, and so on. All the platitudes of liberal, liberal democracy, in short, banal though they might be, they are right, it seems to me, in the sense of explaining our, our, our experience. And we should, as much as I detest that word should, insist that all governmental actors, judges included, behave with a little epistemological modesty. No, actually, they should behave with a lot of epistemological modesty. Judges in particular should so behave precisely because of their insulation from the political process. The, 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 the one view that seems to be expressed by people associated with the Federalist policy is somehow insulating judges from the political process uh, is a good thing. Uh, in some ways it is, but it's only, it only is if they're pursuing something like objective truth. If they're pursuing other things, it's not. In my humble, subjective opinion, a judge like the justices in Roper who assert that it's really up to the judges in light of their own subjective beliefs to decide important questions and the rest of us be damned, commit impeachable offenses, no different from a president who subverts the constitutional order. To be sure, there may be only a question of degree between the arrogance of Justice Kennedy and, his, and those who concurred with him in Roper and the judge who agonizingly sees no way out of the box of decision but to invoke a moral proposition. But it is precisely the difference between arrogance and agony that you and I, the citizens of this country, should patrol in the, in the judiciary. At least, as I said previously, if you're in, into helping sustain astonishing civilizations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Allen. Our third speaker is Professor Michael Moore. Professor Moore is the Charles Walgreen, Jr. University Chair and Professor of Law and Philosophy at the University of Illinois uh, College of Law. Professor Moore is a graduate of the Harvard Law School, um, but I understand before law school he was uh, an avid high school skier. And uh, he tells me that he spent a year as a summer associate in Denver way back when, and I wonder if uh, that clerkship was designed to test whether he should come to Colorado and continue his championship ski um, opportunities. Um, maybe there's a professorship at CU or DU that uh, uh, might lure you out one of these years. Um, Professor Moore uh, has taught at numerous law schools in his career and has been at the University of Illinois since 2002. Uh, notably, he's had a recent uh, series of international experience in his teaching and has been a visiting professor in Israel, Argentina, Australia, Germany, and Italy um, over, the, over the past decade. He's well known for his work on theories of uh, punishment and has countless publications to his name exploring uh, his ideas and theories. He's currently editor-in-chief of the Journal of Law uh, and Philosophy, and uh, both uh, Professor Moore and Professor Allen are affiliated with Northwestern University's Journal of Criminal Law and Criminal Law, Criminology uh, Professor Moore is a member of the Board of Edit Editors, and Professor Allen's on the uh, Board of Advisors. With that, Professor Michael Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. It is nice to be back here. I used to teach here a long time ago, and um, also came to the Federalist Society meeting that was here in 1995. So I was sitting in my old uh, class preparation at Starbucks, one of the original Starbucks, about four blocks from the law school this morning, thinking, you know, it's a total waste of time to prepare remarks. Ron's going to say things with which I so disagree. All I have to do is listen, put some knots in front of his sentences, and I'll have a great talk. <laughs> so I'm really tempted to do that. Um, but I do want to talk a bit about what, what the text 
um, we're supposed to interpret is, namely the Eighth Amendment and moral choices. Uh, I do want to say, and I'll try to show why as I go through my, my remarks, I think if you're a moral skeptic, Ron's right to focus on that issue. He's an epistemological skeptic and a metaphysical skeptic. There aren't right answers to morality, and even if there were, they're not reliably known. Lawrence, I actually think, is the same, my colleague from San Diego when I used to teach there. Um, if you have that view, I don't think our Constitution makes a lot of sense to you. I don't think judicial review can make much sense. I don't think the rights protecting clauses of the Bill of Rights make much sense to you. I don't think the Civil War experience makes much sense to you. There are people who are like that, and I want to talk about some of them, like Bob Bork. But those are the folks who don't believe in judicial review. They think Marbury is wrongly decided. They don't agree with Madison and Hamilton and their Lockean views about natural rights all human beings possess. So Ron's right to worry. Why was he invited here? Right? This, is the, this is the Federalist Society, for God's sakes. All right. Let me, see, let me see what I think the topic is. It's supposed to be moral choices in the Eighth Amendment. Now, that's the specific topic. I take that to be an instance in the context of a conference on law and morality of a much more general topic. Namely, what's the role of moral reasoning by judges in constitutional interpretation, at least for us? The United States will suffice. The Eighth Amendment is a good illustration of that general problem for a series of reasons, one of which, gone through by Lawrence in some detail, is we actually know the history both of the clauses that preceded it, the drafts that were considered that were more specific and then replaced by the general cruel and unusual punishment clause. We know a great deal of the history of what, into, what went into the making of the clause. And we know, of course, the history of the penalties thought to be acceptable at the time. So for those who had the narrow intentionalism, say, of the Mies administration, where you look for intended exemplars, we know to a fact that executing young people, the Roper issue, was not unconstitutional as long as they were over seven. So we know a lot of history. If, if that is important to you, then you can use the history. That's one reason that's a good illustration of the general problem. A second reason is that it's been the focus for the general theoretical debate between people like Paul Brest, the misconceived quest for originalism, um, Ed Meese, Ronnie Dworkin, the two generations, the Raoul Berger, Powell debate about interpretive intent in the 80s, all focused on the cruel and unusual punishment clause, in part because we have the history, uh, and in part for the last reason I want to mention, which is this one. It's interesting, thirdly, if you look at the Supreme Court opinions, from Weems all the way through, Stewart's opinion in Gregg, Kennedy's opinion in Roper, the justices are most self-conscious about the role of moral reasoning and what kind of reasoning they should be doing in Eighth Amendment jurisprudence. The only other place they seem that self-conscious is in 14th Amendment jurisprudence under the Due Process Clause. But they seem to be most self-conscious. Their opinions themselves are little essays in judicial philosophy. So it makes a very good illustration of the general topic. Now, if I had more time, I would have a long sort of discussion of what else besides moral reasoning goes into constitutional interpretation, including the Eighth Amendment. You might indeed want to use some of Lawrence's history, for example, for either the intentions of the framers or the beliefs of their original audience. You might want to use, of course, Supreme Court precedent, quite a few other things, the semantics of the words that appear, the pragmatics of the linguists say in the context of their utterance, Frank Easterbrook's default rules, tiebreakers, as he calls them. There's a whole bunch of things. We had a conference here at Northwestern, 1995, Law and Linguistics where we put together a list of 10 things you might have that are not moral things going into constitutional interpretation, structural stuff. Um, but I think we enough for the day if we focus on the role of moral reasoning in constitutional interpretation with our exemplar being the cruel and unusual punishment clause. Now, I want to make three points in my limited time, and it's going to be briefly. The first point is the point specifically against the kind of skepticism I think Ron evinced about the use of morality by judges. I don't think you can have the constitutional scheme we have and eschew moral reasoning by judges of some kind or another. I'm going to talk about what kinds there are, but of some kind or another. We have a really good exemplar of someone who tried that, the Sixth Symposium, what I call the wake for Bob Bork's lost Supreme Court seat was held by the Federalist Society at UVA in 1988. Scalia and I and um, Richard Epstein were the first panel discussing Bork's theory. Here was my take on Bork's theory. Bork's theory wants to be value neutral 
A, because democracy is good, B, because he's a skeptic, didn't believe there were things that were really rights, and C, judges wouldn't know them anyway. They tend to put their own stuff in anyway, even if, um, even if there were such things. So he was a skeptic, and if you look at Bork's theory of interpretation, pre-confirmation conversion, as we called it at the time, it had two parts to it. One was a very strong default rule. Namely, if a statute doesn't meet the criterion the second part announces, then it is constitutional. And then the second part is a narrow intentionalism at the time then in vogue. Namely, if the statute in question is not an instance of the specifically intended exemplar of the clause at the time it was passed as an exemplar of an unconstitutional law, um, then it's not included in the clause. Example, the Equal Protection Clause. That was the famous cross-examination by Erlen Specter on the sixth morning of the hearings as to how you could get gender discrimination out of that theory of interpretation to which the honest answer pre-conversion was that you can't. If you look at the 14th Amendment's history, it looks pretty clearly engendered to validate the Civil Rights Act of Congress invalidating the black codes of the Reconstructionist South, in which event anything not connected to racial discrimination is not intended by those founders, and thus gender discrimination is not included. Now that is to emasculate what equal protection is. It is to emasculate the clause that says everybody has the right to equal protection of the laws. You can do that. You can do it the way John Ely did in his famous book, who also was a moral skeptic, thinking that judges using their moral values, however sourced, was illegitimate in which event you eliminate judicial review except for the procedural sense of reinforcing democracy. I asked my fellow panelist in 1988, Nino Scalia, my former colleague, we overlapped for a year at Stanford, why a good Catholic lad like himself was joining all these skeptics? But nonetheless, Scalia's jurisprudence tends also to disavow Marbury versus Madison. If you think Marbury is rightly decided, if you think the Madisonian compromise is the right compromise, you better not be the kind of skeptic that therefore thinks you can't have moral reasoning. Seems to me essential. If you look at the Eighth Amendment jurisprudence specifically, you'll see, of course, the cases engaged in moral reasoning all the time. They have to. There is proportionality review both in the death cases and the non-death cases. So to ask the Roper question, does anybody deserve to die who is sufficiently young that you don't think they've reached that mental maturity that marks their moral agency? If you want to ask that question, that's surely a moral question. The proportionality questions of Atkins with regard to mental retardation the same, Coker the same, is raping someone sufficiently bad that you can deserve the death penalty for it and so forth. Um, those are straightforwardly moral questions. You need to have a theory of punishment, i.e. what's excessive in relation to such a theory, and any plausible theory of punishment will have moral desert as at least a limiting condition where your tributivist thinks it's also a sufficient condition, a limiting condition of punishment, and there's nothing more moral than the question of what is culpable wrongdoing deserving of punishment. The other set of cases of the court, the kinds of punishment cases, you may think, for example, a torturer deserves to be tortured if you have the old lex talionis view of desert, but that nonetheless it violates the torturer's right not to be tortured to so torture him, in which event you side constrain punishment by something else, namely the basic human rights, the Bill of Rights were enacted to protect. That, of course, is a straightforward moral judgment, too. So I take it it is impossible, if you like our scheme, to have value-free constitutional adjudication. That leads me to my second inquiry, then what source of values are there? Here the Supreme Court, I think, has been helpful. You have a forest and trees problem. Here's the forest. There really are, are only two possibilities. You either have judges making their own first person committed moral judgments, what some people call critical morality, or you have judges doing what I call moral sociology. It's a third person judgment about what some other group of persons believe. That's the basic choice. And if you look at, say, Stewart's opinion in Gregg through Kennedy's opinion in Roper, they try to do both explicitly. Here's the part they say where we're doing our first person judgment. Here's the part where we're doing our third person sociology about other people's first person judgments, right? They try to do both of those um, sorts of things. Now, just a word about each of those possibilities. About objective moral, excuse me, about first person moral judgments. Those of us who are what today are called moral realists, if you like, secular natural lawyers, um, and there are actually a lot of us. I thought we were rather underrepresented last night on the, the panel. If you want to see sort of where they hang out, go to the Wisconsin Metaethics Conference every September. 
you see hundreds of people, A, who don't believe in God at all, and B, who think morality is a, as objective as science. So there's a lot of those folks, and they all have PhDs in philosophy, so you can listen to them without thinking they're hopelessly naive, at least. Um, suppose you're an objectivist, then you're gonna distinguish two kinds of first-person judgment. There's the first-person judgment that says, it's right because I judge it so. That's the umpire who says, ain't nothing till I call him. And there's the first person judgment that says, I call him as I see him. It's antecedently true whether cruel and unusual punishments prohibit, say, the death penalty for youth. My job is to try and judge whether that is true or not, or true or false. Of course I have to use my first person judgment. I have to use my first person judgment about anything, because I'm me. I have to judge whether the sun's gonna come up tomorrow. That's my judgment. Can't get out of my judgment, but it judges something independent of me namely whether there's a right to cruel and unusual punishment that specifically forbids death for someone who doesn't deserve it because they're young. That's the first person judgment. The other, uh, of the objective sort, the other is, you might think we give judges the power to make them um, as they themselves believe it to be. That is, we give them strong discretion. We say to them, if you think it's cruel and unusual, then it's cruel and unusual. Now, if you're a skeptic about morality, that's all first-person judgments ever can look like to you. If you don't think, as Ryan, Ron clearly does not, there's a mind-independent moral reality to which true moral propositions correspond, then all you can think first-person judgments are are subjective assertions of preference. For him, he then joins Holmes, also another skeptic, who in his article, Natural Law, 1915, said, ah, well, there's no answer to moral questions, but ain't it great to be on the court? Someone's values have to go in, thank God it's mine, right? That's much harder to justify than if you're Madison, Hamilton, and Locke behind them. It's my judgment, but what it judges is, of course, not my creation. So the possibilities for first-person judgments are twofold. The possibility for third-person sociology is a rich panoply of sort of highly charged rhetoric the Supreme Court likes in what I like to see as its flight from responsibility. So we have not only Earl Warren's, the canons of decency which express, that mark the progress of a maturing society. Before that, we had Felix Frankfurter's, those canons of decency and fairness which express the notions of justice of English-speaking peoples, to which Hugo Black always said, what happened to the French? Um, Cardozo's, the principles of justice so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people as to be ranked as fundamental. Or Scalia's, the most specific level at which a relevant tradition can be identified and so forth and so on. If you look at all the things that justices or theorists have said, there's a wild variety of different things going under the name of some kind of conventional morality. Here's an easy taxonomic scheme. Divide them up by time, degree of population that has to hold them, and then also by degree of reconstruction the judge is willing to engage in as he or she decides what the majority believes. Do the time one first you can ask what the original audience of the text believed or the framers, the original moral beliefs. What do they believe about the death penalty? Or you can believe, you can ask some Scalia-like question. If you can't get to the originalist, maybe you can get to the longest social tradition even if it wasn't original. That's one possibility. Earl Warren, when he said the evolving standards of decency, I think clearly had in mind contemporary consensus. What do people right now think? The question the Supreme Court was so surprised by, as Judge, uh, as, as Tim put, pointed out, which is the 72, 76 surprise. 72, they said, America's gone against the death penalty, and then after all the legislation passing it said, well, we got that sociology wrong, they really do favor it. That's the contemporary consensus. There was old Alex Pickles idea that you could sort of predict the future, predict what the consensus will be in the future. Of course, the future is part of what your court decision is going to influence. Anyway, that's the time dimension. The who holds it division, um, all of the world, that would be the universals if you look around the world, or Frankfurt is only the English speaking, they're the only civilized people, or the United States, or some subset of US population. Jerome Frank used to have concurring opinions where remarkably he'd say when they got to a moral question like should you deport someone for bad moral character, learned hand would say let's ask consensus moral opinions Judge Frank says, I don't care what most people think. I only care what our ethical leaders think. So he would judge who the leaders were and ask what they thought about um, particular questions like euthanasia and whether it evinced bad moral character. You can do that. 
Third is this reconstruction. You can have unreconstructed popular beliefs, just take them as they issue. What, what do most people think about abortion? Whatever they say in a Gallup poll is what they think. Or you can do the more sophisticated stuff, like Thurgood Marshall and the death cases. Well, once he found out that most people actually favor death, what he then said was, well, it's what most people would think if they were fully educated and experienced what death really looks like, right? It does make you chuckle, right? Obvious sham. Does that differ even the slightest from what Thurgood Marshall thought? Answer, of course not. Or even worse, Ronnie Dworkin, which is his coherence of the community morality describing the deep principles that best cohere and explain the more mass of particular judgments. Not surprisingly, that doesn't differ a whit from what Ronnie Dworkin himself always thinks on every conceivable issue, this reconstructed morality. Now, put all those together, just call them the flight to third-person sociology of other people's moral beliefs. And that gets me to my third and last point, which is why it is judges, at least in part, have to make their own moral judgments in the first person, in cruel and unusual punishment cases, and throughout constitutional interpretation. The first is an easy argument. It's one I think Ron anticipated. Of course, you have to judge, even if your judgment is to defer to consensus opinion. The reason you defer typically is because you value democracy and you fear the bad values that come out of judicial capriciousness, in which event you make the moral judgment not to make moral judgments yourself on the merits, but rather to defer to conventions. You at least have to make that much of a moral judgment. Now, that's only sort of a popping of a balloon point. I regard that as a sort of get a few troops on, establish the beachhead, but now we've got to get some troops ashore. So the real arguments, I think, are three. One is the argument we discussed at length at the Sixth Symposium on Borg in 1988 at Virginia. And it's what John Harrison at UVA now calls the Mark III originalism argument, which he attributes to me. I don't know where he got Mark III. My sailboat at San Diego is a Mark III Catalina, but I don't think that's the name. Here's the thought. If you really care what the framers thought, then put yourself in their mindset, both in 1791 and in 1868. They had two beliefs of particular relevance to you, one of them ontological, one of them semantic. The ontological belief was a belief in natural rights. Read a book like Morton White, good historian and a good philosopher, about the philosophical beliefs of Madison and Hamilton and how they derive both their metaphysics and their epistemology from John Locke. The metaphysics of natural rights and the epistemology, as Locke said to his students at Oxford in his lectures in the 1660s, you can know the truths of morality as easy and demonstrate them as easily as the truths of mathematics. If you share that metaphysics and that epistemology, then you think the clauses in the Bill of Rights and in the Civil War Amendments name but do not create rights of human beings that courts should enforce. That's number one. Number two, a semantic thesis. You have what philosophers these days would call referential rather than attributive intentions. If I send you out to go get me some gold, I am referring to a natural kind whose nature guides its meaning. Don't ask me for examples. Don't ask me for definitions. Don't look to some consensus. I don't want any fool's gold. I want the real stuff. You figure out what gold is and then bring me some, right? A statute says to a judge, you can allow organs to be transferred only on the death of a person. Don't give me conventional beliefs about when someone is dead. Tell me when someone is really dead, because it might turn out despite the fact that their heart and lung have ceased spontaneous functioning and they've lost consciousness, they were actually immersed in cold water, so they're actually they're revivable. Don't start cutting out organs of conventionally dead but really alive people. You figure out what death is. Or best interest litigation in custody disputes. Give the child wherever the best interest is maximized. Don't ask what most people Take the famous Iowa case. In Iowa, think would be good. Should he go live with the father who's a hippie in Sausalito or a nice conservative arm on Iowa farm life? It's clear what the Iowa conventions are. It's also clear what the California conventions are. They differ. You just thought what's really in the best interest of a child. Same for cruel and unusual punishment. Now, I'm a little more eclectic than I was 25 years ago. Sometimes people speak with what are called attributive rather than referential intentions. I'll just give you one example. I walked down this morning, sort of wake up from the hotel past Huron Street, Brooks Brothers. An old example of a friend of mine was somebody says, do you go meet the man in the Brooks Brothers suit? 
usually people have referential intentions, namely go meet that person irrespective of whether he's really wearing a Brooks Brothers suit or not. The definition doesn't guide the meaning, the nature of the thing referred to does. However, when my wife says to me, go see the man in the Brooks Brothers suit, it's often attributive, namely, I don't care who you see, just go look at a good, well-dressed man. In which event, anyone who has the property, the convention-satisfied well-dressed suit is what's picked out. Two different kinds of intentions. The semantic thesis I attribute Madison, Hamilton, and Locke is referential. Those things exist and they were referring to them by the rights conferring clauses. Now if you believe those two things, notice what Mark III originalism amounts to. Mark III originalism says, then let's do what the founders did. This is a scheme based on people having real human rights that are outside of politics and we're going to create an institution with judicial review that protects it. That's to engage yourself in some reasoning about the nature of the rights really protected. As Hamilton and Madison said in The Federalists, when they were deciding who should be judges, given the power we're giving them, of course you only want men of virtue. You need some discernment. This is not for everybody. You need some real discernment about the nature of rights. This argument is a bit hostage to who you put on the bench. Anyway, that's argument number two. Argument number three is what I call the backdoor argument. Suppose the Supreme Court is right, as I think it is. There are only really two possibilities once you admit you have to make moral judgments in cruel and unusual interpretation cases and constitutional cases generally. Either first-person judgments of the judge themselves or third-person sociological judgments. Those are the choices. If you eliminate the sociological choices, that leaves the first person. Against sociological choices about other people's moral beliefs, there are two really rather decisive objections. One is John Ely's objection back in his book in 1980 and his Supreme Court forward in 78. Ely rightfully says, between a court and a legislature, can anyone seriously think that courts are better reflectors of community conventions than our representative institutions that stand for free and regular elections. If the name of the game of judicial review were truly to protect conventionally enshrined rights, why in God's green earth would you think the appointment system for judges would give you an institution better at reflecting consensus than the institution we set up to be representative? It makes, as he says, I think quite accurately, no sense. Now since Ely was a skeptic, that led for him to no substantive review. If you're not a skeptic, it leads the other way. Second argument is this one. Remember the Madisonian Compromise. Madisonian Compromise is the great fear of the tyranny, the majority by enshrining the rights of the minority. Now ask yourself, suppose the rights of the minority are interpreted by majority belief of any kind, conventions of any of the stripe that I mentioned. Well, what's it worth to have a right good against the majority when that right is interpreted by the majority? Would the Nazis have marched in Skokie by the majority's interpretation of free speech? I don't think so. The rights enshrined in the Madisonian Compromise are supposed to be good against the majority. The last thing on God's green earth you want to do is give a majoritarian interpretation of minority rights against the majority. It doesn't make any sense to set it up that way. In which event, at some point, some judge has to say what are the rights people really have, not the rights the contemporary majority or any other consensus believes they have. Last argument, I think judges simply do better in their adjudications under the Constitution if they make committed, first-person, emotion-laden judgments rather than the dry recitation of moral shibboleths accepted by others. That is, it takes your own commitment, your own standing behind your decision, your own responsibility for it to do what Kennedy did, Stuart before him, and say, this is what I think is right with regard to whether a young person deserves to be put to death um, in violation of the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. Not what other people think, this is what I think. It's a lovely debate about this in the immigration cases where Learned Hand famously deferred to popular judgment despite the morally appealing cases. So in one of those classes of cases, you're trying to decide to deport someone if they lack good moral character. The case in front of him was an Italian immigrant who had killed his fourth out of five children because he couldn't put the rest through school and he was having a very hard time with this retarded, hopelessly deformed kid. So he euthanized him. Did that prevent his petition for citizenship? Hand dryly recites the conventional moral shibboleth that you don't get to kill people, particularly kids, particularly if they're your own, and left it at that. Yet actually the, the moral issue is much more interesting. However you think you come out, it's much more interesting.
then that in hand would have done a lot better if he were, in the words of Edmund Kahn, seriously in session with himself, trying to figure out whether he really had good moral character or not. I leave you with this. Herbert Hart, before he took the chair in jurisprudence, said, the first job, and indeed the main job of a judge, is to judge, not surprisingly. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Moore and uh, panelists. We have time for uh, questions, and um, our format here is uh, we have two microphones uh, towards the front, and I already see uh, uh, Professor Calabresi is uh, geared up for the first question. So um, uh, we'll take those uh, kind of alternating sides, um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. My question is for Lori Klaus, and it's a two-part question. Uh, the first question is, uh, do you think an argument could be made in terms of the original meaning of the cruel and unusual punishment clause that um, there, there are a couple of things that suggest that the federal government is, uh, ought to be bound by uh, a proportionality test in the punishments it imposes? And the argument would go as follows. It would be an original meaning argument about what the phrase uh, cruel and unusual meant in 1787. The first thing one would note is the Eighth Amendment bans excessive fines and bail, as you mentioned. The word excessive seems to, combine, to contain a proportionality requirement. Um, if there's a proportionality requirement for depriving people of property in the form of fines and bail, then it would seem odd that there wouldn't be some sort of proportionality requirement for deprivations of life or liberty. Second, by the time the, uh, by the 1780s when the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause was adopted, there had been uh, important writing by Cesare Beccaria about the importance of proportionality in punishment that was widely accepted by Enlightenment thinkers. Beccaria's work had a huge impact in the civil law tradition and must have been known to the framers of the Constitution. And so Beccaria's work, I think, would Cast, would, would carry some weight even in, a, in addition to the evidence about what the phrase had meant in the English Bill of Rights. Um, and then finally, the Federalists all told us that, of course, the Eighth Amendment was unnecessary because Congress didn't have enumerated power to impose cruel and unusual punishments in the first place. Congress's power to impose punishments flows out of the Necessary and Proper Clause. So even without regard to what the Eighth Amendment says, for a punishment to be constitutional if it's imposed by the federal government, it has to be necessary and proper, and those words would seem to connote some level of proportionality review. So my first question is basically, you know, the Supreme Court for 100 years has said that the Eighth Amendment requires proportionality review. Isn't there a lot of evidence the court is right? My second point would be, if one is conducting that proportionality review, um, I, it seems to me that the, that the question is not do, do the judges think something is cruel and unusual, but does society today think something is cruel and unusual? And the easiest test for that would be to look at state law, as the court has done, and try to see what the consensus of state law is. Um, that we have a rule in the Constitution for determining when there's a consensus of state law. It's Article 5. It says that there has to be a consensus of three-quarters of the states for something to attain constitutional meaning. So I would say something is disproportionate under the Eighth Amendment if three-quarters of the states reject it. That's not true of the juvenile death penalty. That's not true of the death penalty for the retarded. It may be true of some other cases that have come before the court, such as the three strikes and your outlaw. Any comment on either of those points? Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, that's a, a fascinating point you make about the necessary and proper clause as a potential source of power for proportionality inquiry, and I um, uh, haven't heard that argument before, and it, make, it seems quite plausible to me as a potential source. I think the great difficulty with grounding a proportionality inquiry in the Eighth Amendment is the language of unusualness and, the his, and, and what evidence we have about what would count as um, uh, unusualness as the clause was historically cast. Um, that uh, inter-jurisdictional comparison um, uh, is not something that was um, historically what unusual meant. Um, and 
to uh, seize on it now, therefore, would be um, uh, anomalous if one is then going to flip to the other connotations of the Eighth Amendment as well in other contexts and say, well, it means intra-jurisdictional novelty when we're dealing with one of those cases too, and it means uh, just something we haven't used much it's, if it's some other context where that's the, the way to express it. It's just a, a, a novel way to use language if we're just going to flip around based on linguistic happenstance. Um, so a, a simple proportionality inquiry, of course, doesn't, doesn't give uh, unusualness anything to do. Um, and as to the usage of uh, three, uh, some proportion of the states as, as the foundation of inquiry, well, that would be um, uh, certainly a recharacterization of um, the clause. There's nothing in the debate uh, in Congress suggested that proportionality was what was on their minds. There's certainly no evidence of that. But certainly, um, and then the early applications of the, of the language in the 19th century um, principally in a context where it's severed from the references to excessive bail and excessive fines and located in uh, statutes at state level, there are a lot of state statutes, particularly in the South, dealing with uh, improper treatment of slaves. Cruel and unusual treatment of slaves was a, a basis, was a criminal offence in, in southern states. Um, and uh, there was federal law that, uh, federal statutes that made cruel and unusual treatment of uh, sailors on ships um, uh, an offence. And the judicial application of those phrases uh, focused on vicious methods, right, something that wasn't part of the history particularly at all up to that point, but which was consistent with an evolving um, uh, concern about vicious methods in the wider society, right? This is the, the era in which the, the more grotesque forms of violence to people as, as methods of punishment dropped away um, from the statute books. Um, so it seemed natural uh, for courts to turn to that conception. But we don't really get proportionality appearing in judicial opinions as an understanding of what cruel and unusual might mean until Justice Field comes along, um, uh, sort of after the, um, after the 14th Amendment. So that even in, even in respect of the adoption of the 14th Amendment, we don't really have um, a proportionality vision of the um, cruel and unusual concept coming through in judicial discourse. Um. Professor Grolia. I'm Lino Grolia of the University of Texas. I'd like to address this to Professor Moore. You said uh, at the end that Kennedy, uh, with approval, that Kennedy decided the uh, cruel and unusual thing, saying this is what I believe. And that, I think, sets very well the single issue of constitutional law in general, not just uh, cruel and unusual, namely the proper role of the court. The question is simply who should be making the social policy decision? Should it be made uh, by majority vote of the nine justices or by the majority vote of elected representatives? That's uh, the central question. You, you, you cite Madison for so much of your views, which is appropriate, but Madison, something like Jefferson, perhaps wrote and said enough to be citable on both sides of many propositions. One thing he was very clear on is that the Constitution should be interpreted to mean what it was intended to mean. Is unless you stick strictly to the original intent, then you're leaving it up to the judges. There's no, the only alternative to it means what it was supposed to mean is it means whatever the judges seek to have it mean. And he says that would be very wrong. On the subject of judicial review, he agreed with uh, uh, Jefferson that each department should have independent uh, views on this. But he recognized realistically, but what's going to happen is the Supreme Court will have the last word. And he says, and that can't be right. Now, everything you've said is opposed to that. And you know, you, you question Bork, or more than question, deride, for essentially supporting this. That is, the, the issue is, uh, when should the Supreme Court declare a public policy judgment invalid? And substitute its views based on morality, whether it is objective morality or not, for the view expressed in the uh, uh, resulted from the ordinary political process. And the theory of constitutional law is that the courts are entitled to do that, not because they're better moral reasoners, that hands should have uh, looked inside his heart and have found a better reason. No, the idea is that the Constitution disallows it. That's all there is. So the question is, does the Constitution disallow this policy choice? Now, happily, it being a very good, wise Constitution, it disallows very little. And so, and, and, and if there you say, well, sometimes we don't know the original intent, that's true. And, and, but unless we know 
that the Constitution disallows this choice? It doesn't. In other words, in cases of doubt as to whether this public policy is permissible, presumably in a democracy, if we favor that, maybe that's a moral judgment, as you say, seems to be one of the most basic, that it is better to have a system where the rules are made according to the views of the people in general, rather than to the insights of a Kennedy or even a hand. That, that's the only issue, and, uh, they, and if, it's, if it's in doubt as to what the Constitution disallows, and as I say, happily, it realistically looked at what Bork is saying, it disallows very little, it's very wise. Most things are left to the people, that's the idea. Uh, then uh, uh, if it's not clearly disallowed, it's not, and that's the end of it. It settles the question of how public policy decisions should be made. Lino, it's great to hear from you again. Lino was the next speaker in 1988 after me. I think every sentence went something like this. Professor Moore believes, but I think actually the debate is, is where it was back then. Because when you say it's constitutional unless the Constitution prohibits it, okay, then the question is what's the Constitution? If the Constitution uses language that refers to equality, because it says equal protection of the laws. It doesn't say racial discrimination. It says equal protection of the laws. That goes well beyond throwing out black codes or other racially discriminatory codes. Now, how do you figure out what gender discrimination is offensive of equal protection? The only thing you can do is make the moral judgment about what equality really demands. And the same for cruel and unusual punishment. And is that in the Constitution? You bet. It refers to equality. It doesn't refer to anything more specific. And the same for the cruel and unusual punishment clause. When they put away the specific proposals for clauses of specific prohibitions, they said, we can prohibit cruel and unusual punishment. My argument of the second of the four was historically that makes a lot of sense if, like Madison, you really think there are natural rights. You don't have to lay them out in great detail as long as you get virtuous judges. You can refer to them and they can figure it out. And as Randy Barnett laid on me last night after his talk, even the Ninth Amendment, right? All the articles Randy has written about the Ninth Amendment, you don't even have to name them. You can just sort of throw a reference out to all of them and that's okay too. I think that's based essentially on a mistaken premise. Name, beginning with the Equal Protection Clause, Notice the Equal Protection Clause, the noun is protection. And it appears fairly clearly, as uh, uh, David Curry at Chicago and others have shown, that it was, it's not a requirement of equality. I mean, what a requirement of equality is is quite difficult. So the issue is, is it the case that because there's the 14th Amendment in the Constitution, a state may not discriminate on, sex, on the basis of sex? And the answer to that is very clear. No one thought that the 14th Amendment had anything to do with sex discrimination. The fact that the word equal is in there, that doesn't give a court the authority or the, the permission to take, so we're going to disallow sex discrimination? At the time of the 14th Amendment, whenever they wanted to give an example, as you know, of the most clearly permissible discrimination, you know, like in Strouder, obviously no one would deny that men and women are very different, so the law can discriminate on the basis of sex. Now to come along and say, ah, the word is equal there, and that means we judges can prohibit racial discrimination. You're just making that all up. Yeah, we, um, we only have a few minutes left, so um, let's go ahead and take um, the next question. And, and Lito, you have more courage than Bob Bork, but like him, that won't get you a Supreme Court seat. <laughs> go ahead. I'm Lindsay Grinnells from the University of Virginia School of Law, and I have a question for Professor Allen. After your remarks on moral propositions, I was just curious to hear how you would respond to Professor Baker of LSU that we heard at last night's panel. He started with Alistair McIntyre's quote that morality by itself is nothing nothingness, but that there is an American morality and it's our rule of law and that can be learned through the study of private law subjects and common law. So do you disagree with that idea of an American morality or, and if not, do you disagree that it could be learned? Well, unfortunately, I missed uh, the presentation, the second presentation last night, um, so I may not uh, fully understand what was discussed. Um, look, I find a lot of these discussions sort of curiously off the point. Um, you know, my, the, the central message that I was trying to convey was that the kinds of data that were that are pertinent to this debate resist formulation in general theories so that you can articulate a general theory and then deduce outcomes about it. 
So when I hear this debate between the previous speaker, previous speaker questioner, and um, uh, Michael, um, I, I just look. I mean, it's not the case that either you're going to have judges do whatever they like, the virtuous, the the the, the, the final extreme of the virtuous judge theory. And it's not the case that you can tell judges never to take into account moral propositions. It, but you can have more or less. And you, and you have to structure that in light of what you think is the best structure for government uh, given the interests that you want to pursue. Now, how does this bear upon your questions? My own, now I, I want to assert, subjective view about the evidence indicates that we should try to suppress the exercise of individual judgments by all political actors, frankly, uh, uh, but spe especially judges, not especially legislators. I mean, if to, to some extent, they're there to permit those things to be negotiated, whereas judges aren't. Now, I, I don't want to claim that that can be done entirely. That's not my claim, but it can be reduced or it can be encouraged. I want to reduce it. How does all that map onto your question? Well, if we say to judges, and if we actually write a statute or a constitutional provision that says to a judge, you know, employ your own moral reasoning, then I would say, okay, that's what we've done, that's what we've written, that's what we've said, that's fine. If that's how we, if, if that's how we describe their job description, but I want them to follow our, our description of their job description. Uh, one thing you might say to them, and I think is perfectly rational, and I, I simply disagree about the significance of the criticisms of it, of it, is to say to judges, when you have moral questions, you ought to consult uh, the sociological question about American morality. So if there is such a thing, and if we say to them, consult it, then I'd say, fine, go ahead and consult it. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but I didn't think I'd get another chance to say anything today, so. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Allen, uh, this ah, is for I you, too. I do have a chance to so. say something. My apologies. I wouldn't have gone on so long last right. time. Uh, in your talk, you said something along the lines of, you know, if we look at the history of the 20th century, we see that belief in moral truth leads to mass slaughter. And, and that I didn't seems... say truth. I said people who thought they were in possession. I, I didn't say moral truth, but I, I, was implying, well, I was implying the connection. I agree. I was implying right. it. I mean, that seems like a kind of strange read of, of the history to me. You know, Hitler and Stalin don't strike me as being particular lover, lovers of moral truth. But the people who fought them were Solzhenitsyn, Blakov Havel, Reagan, Churchill, Orwell. They not only believed in moral truth, but if they hadn't, they wouldn't have done what they did to bring down uh, those totalitarian regimes. So if we're going to look empirically, I would think that we would need moral truth and belief in moral truth in order to preserve uh, freedom.